you know how renting with dogs can be a bit difficult sometimes and how the conversation about this has kind of fallen off the radar recently that's why we're excited right because we're jumping on zoom now to speak to russell hunt from pets let's who's an expert on the subject i'm anna webb welcome to a dog's life Russell Hunt, welcome to A Dog's Life for the very first time. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for inviting me. Really exciting. Yes, no, I'm really excited about chatting, actually, because we we have chatted on the radio already. And I really love the way you describe things, because what we're talking about is renting with pets. Yes, a a massive subject, uh, which I think I agree with you has kind of gone off the radar a bit. I'm glad you think that because when was it? It was 2021 that in a way government kind of really took the reins, didn't they? And, you know, were very vocal about model tenancy agreements that were to be mandatory that you could have a pet. I think that's right. There was a lot of chat. There was a law called Jasmine's Law as well, wasn't there, Russell? Well, there was, a, I mean, there was a whole thing of of suggesting that the templates, wasn't it? The tenancy templates that landlords could use. And, you know, coming from an estate agency background, being a landlord myself, you kind of know what landlords are going to do. Um, maybe I'm a little bit cynical, but they're just going to look at it and ignore it and do what they want. So, and so many people were confused by it because they just thought that the law had changed. And I used to get so many messages and still do going, but I thought you're allowed pets. I thought the law's changed. And there's been no guidance on the whole area and there still is no guidance and everything is in limbo with the uh, the forthcoming election. Well, yes, that's right. And hopefully, because there is the renters reform bill kind of, you know, lying in the sidelines, isn't it? Isn't it to yes. kind of be discussed, to change things for all renters, whether you're renting with a, with a dog or not? Correct. Yes. I mean, it will change. It, it needs reforming. You know, there's a whole, the abolition of section 21, um, Angela Rayner was interviewed on LBC recently and she said, yes, we will abolish it. But of course, she also then went on to say we want to find a balance between tenants and landlords. Um, and mm-hmm. I think the system doesn't work in its current format. No, it's it's interesting, isn't it? And of course, I would assume I'm getting on a bit now. So um, um not at all. <laughs> oh, see, Russell, this is why you're welcome back um anytime. <laughs> It seems that more people are renting or or not. I mean, when I was when I was young, you had to get on the ladder. You had to get on the ladder. There was this terrible pressure. And and if you weren't on the ladder, you were like, no, oh, why not? Sort of thing. And it, it seems in this country anyway, it was like this obsession to buy a property. Whereas in Paris, where I did live and work for two years, very blessed, one of the greatest two years of my life, no one buys their flat in Paris. You all rent. But that's so true that that we did, you know, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not a spring chicken. And you kind of grew up with that whole philosophy of when you're going to get on the housing ladder. And there was that pressure. Totally agree with you. I think that's changing. And I think, it, as you mentioned, I think it's going down the European model. I mean, I spent time in Germany and like, you know, like you mentioned in Paris, people didn't didn't buy. They rented, you know, that it wasn't the norm to buy. And I think we are going down the European model because of unaffordability um the changes in the rules um people can't afford to and actually when you talk to youngsters and I've got three teenagers myself they kind of want to enjoy life a bit rather than being saddled with a mortgage Mm, yes yes but but rents are very high right you know but uh so I don't know I'm not sure I could afford to rent at the moment I'm quite sad (laughs) I think it's she laughs hysterically no but it's it's frightening isn't it because it's not it it, it, the rents have just shot up and then also it's all about the affordability checks that the tenants have got to jump through to actually secure the property Yes, yeah, no, absolutely. And then we've seen this huge rise in in dog ownership, haven't we, really, in the last four years, but Mm. it was growing before the pandemic. I rented out a flat for a while when I moved to the Shire. I encouraged the estate agent to, you know, look, this is a perfect property to live with a dog and a cat the cat flaps already installed, selling it proactively, actually, for somebody to move in with pets, because I was very comfortable as the landlord, technically, for that to to happen, you know. But, you know, for people with with pets, it, it, it is difficult. 
it is, it is really difficult and it's such a competitive market at the moment you know I, as you know i i help clients find pet friendly rentals in and around london and you are just against other people who don't have pets you know landlords prefer young professionals who are rarely in the property so there's minimal wear and tear you know keep their costs down so someone with a pet is not that appealing so you really have to befriend the agent who's dealing with it for example to to kind of get you there to to being one of the first choices so how would they do that is it kind of comparing your dog as being so much you know less destructive dare I say <laughs> than a than a toddler with a with a felt tip pen um, well, <laughs> you, you, you say that but I have a dog with three teenagers and I can tell you which is uh, more relaxed and sleeps most of the time um but yes I mean the, but yes, children are being compared to pets. A lot there are properties that are not allowing small children because of what you've just said. Really? But yes, there are. Really? I've seen I've seen listings on Right Move, and I've spoken to agents who said, "Yep, no small children in those properties because of they don't want the wear and tear with 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 the crayons with." plastic you know big buggies etc marking the walls etc so yep it, it's going down that route and um i think with pet owners it's all about showing that you are a responsible pet owner who can afford to pay the rent those are the key points and pet series are a really really useful tool to show that you are responsible particularly if you've got a dog training qualifications if you work from home a lot then say so because Landlords get worried about dogs being left alone all the time. You know, if you can get a previous landlord reference saying that you were a brilliant tenant, pay the rent on time, and your dog or cats didn't cause any damage, all those things really, really make a difference. Yes, I absolutely, of course. So I love the thought of a pet CV. You could make it really fun, couldn't you? And 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 that's a lovely way of kind of affirming what all the effort you've put into your dog mainly but of course with cats loads can be done with cats to make them better behaved but how lovely you know you could you know yes my dog regularly you know um accepts visitors into the property and uh you know I, th I think it could be really quite quite creative oh definitely but the one tip I would give Anna is to keep it to one page because it's a bit like a press release you know, agents and landlords won't read the whole thing. They'll read the, the, the main bits and that's it. So keep it short to the point. Some cute images. Don't have an image of your dog or cat chewing something or clawing something. I know that's, uh, <laughs> that, that, you shouldn't you do that. I mean, that's just makes sense anyway, but just little things like that. And, you know, uh, if your dog or cat asleep, it's, it just shows that they're tranquil, relaxed. They're not going to do any damage. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. And 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 this has got to happen. I mean, is it true that the very low statistic is this, that only 7% of landlords currently are open to pets? I think it's more than that. I think the number is higher. Um, I think, I think, as I mentioned on, on the radio programme the other evening, it, it with for one pet, it's easier. When you start getting two or more pets, then I think that is a more... Uh, realistic uh, statistic that you've just given I think landlords are more open nowadays to a small dog or to a house cat etc but also I think that refers more to the private landlords because you've got the increase in the build to rent sector and uh, more and more of those are pet friendly um, I've had clients uh, in in uh, build to rent new builds and they had four cats and now that is a great idea for lots of reasons. You know, I should imagine these places are a bit like working for one of the really cool tech firms that, of course, are very dog friendly now, you know. Yes. And so, you know, that's nice. You work in a tech firm and, and then have a, a lovely place like a, a grown up student residence, maybe. <laughs> that might be not the right way to describe it. But I loved being in my student residence. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's less lonely, isn't it? You, you know, the contracts are more flexible and build to rent. You've got social area so you meet new people you know people with with pets um there's a, there's a lot of them have gyms you know they have meeting rooms so if you want to work from there so you, so you can save the costs on on office space save the costs on on a gym yes the rent's a little bit more expensive as i said the flexi contracts are good and then you're not just kind of tied into a a, a private landlord stuck in a contract on your own on your own with the you know fear of of bills etc it's just a bit more flexible and more sociable 
Mm, and I suppose that does match with the, the statistic that is apparently 59% of um, dogs purchased in, you know, the last four years were by millennials and Generation Z. So they're the younger, you know, working community. Yes, they are. They are. And so they kind of mix, you know, their working life and their home life. No, absolutely. But, you know, your services stretch further than just, you know, you're very, very flexible from what I've heard and really great and kind of help people unravel conundrums that might be moving south from Scotland or maybe even downsizing with dogs or maybe even, you know, being on a work placement, you know, travelling over from the States or, you know, further afield to, to work in London for a period. You know, all of these different, you must have so many different scenarios to solve for people. Uh, yes, yes, you do. And that's that's why I set up the the Relocating to the UK with Pets Facebook group in January. And that's now over 2000 members. And it's really busy because there are so many issues that arise and people just looking for advice, help. And, and it's a great community that that's growing quickly. It's amazing, actually, isn't it? I mean, what, what would be one of your most recent cases to sort of shine out about how you help people? Um, a lovely Canadian client, and she flew in on canine jets with oh. her multi poo. And I picked her up from Farnborough Airport and drove her to her property, which I'd sourced for her. And she was really happy. Gosh, so, did, so oh gosh, so because all of this is new as well, isn't it? With it um, is. a few dedicated airlines now that do let you take your dog in, in the cabin. Do you think that alone, this new change with some airlines, is going to encourage? more movement you know more people thinking do you know what I'm freelance I you know I've got a contract with someone in I'm going to move over to the UK just to change my life have have new experiences because I know I would never put any of my dogs ever in the hold <laughs> well that's it isn't it and and there are you know on the group you see the whole time people are looking for alternatives some will fly via Paris and then get picked up at Paris and go through the tunnel some people will take the boat um, but yes, I think it, there's a there's a growing market of these private charter planes, you know, like canine jets and bark air, et cetera. Um, and also some of them are internal U.S. flights and they go to Paris or they go to Dubai, et cetera. So they're different routes that are, that are emerging. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting that people can fly into Paris. I still haven't researched that as to why Paris Charles de Gaulle is dog friendly and Heathrow isn't but we're well, supposed a... to be the, <laughs> the nation of animal <laughs> lovers know, okay. but we like to make it complicated with paperwork yeah, <laughs> yeah I know so what what is what do you know the reason Russell it, it is because if you've got a smaller pet you can take it in the hold with you and not in the, in, in can, can, sorry can come in the cabin with you and what, in, to land in Paris but that yes, can't you that can't you can't do that at all flying into the UK right is that to do with Brexit? No, it's just always been the way. It's how it's always been in the UK. Right, um, right. Wow. So that's that's why people look at that route, because like yourself, just don't want their, their, their fur babies going into the hold. No, absolutely not. Going back to, you know, government, mm. I mean, one of the things that was kind of highlighted, you know, with the Jasmine Law campaign, I mean, you were very much aware of that, weren't you, Russell? Yes, yes. I was. So, so what did you you think of that? I mean, albeit maybe slightly confusing, I think it did create awareness. Oh, it's definitely it's definitely created awareness. I think it's quite interesting because when I talk to estate agents and I say what I do, you know, I focus on pet friendly rentals. I'm a specialist in that in that sector. A lot of a lot of their reactions is that's very niche. Whereas my thoughts are how can that be niche when over half the UK population and there are millions of people around the world own pets? But that is still the mindset. Yeah, that's that's extraordinary, isn't it? And, you know, for me, I just think, well, surely landlords are missing a trick. Getting this right could really open up the market for them. Perhaps they don't need it opening, but, you know, it's all about servicing what your customers want isn't it i mean aren't customers always supposed to be a bit right well yes but it's also about supply and demand at the moment demand is outstripping supply so therefore landlords can pick and choose who they want so i think whether there's legislation or not a landlord say fine yes I, I know that you know subject to the new legislation i'd have to take a bet but this person is can pay more can stay longer 
and that's the reason I'm going for them. They'll always landlords will always find a loophole. That's that's the nature of of a landlord, and that's what they'll do. Um, and then you know the recommendation with the legislation is that that people be able to offer insurance um, as an option to landlords. Personally, I don't really agree with it. I just think it opens up a new business. I think it's a nice thing to be able to do because a landlord can't ask for it at the moment uh, with the restrictions. But I, I think that with the Tenant Fees Act um, in 2019, which capped it to five week deposit, I think a very simple solution would be just to be able to increase that for pet owners and have some exceptions to the rule where a landlord could ask for more weeks rent as a security deposit. Yes, because I, I guess what you're saying is otherwise people are going to end up spending even more money and, you know, the market's going to become a little bit more complicated and more people are going to be trying, I suppose, to optimise pet owners for money. Well, that's it. And, and the other, also, landlords are very cynical. So, you know, and I've come across this a few times. Landlords say, well, that's fine. They offer an insurance policy, but how do I know they're not going to stop their direct debit after one month? You know, how I, how do I know they're not going to continue paying that? So what landlords do, they'll ask for a whole four years payment of the security or for the entirety of their tenancy agreement. Gosh, yes, but a lot of people wouldn't be able to afford that. Exactly. And also remember that, you know, that landlords, some of them do offer pet charges. So, you know, how many extra costs are pet owners going to have to incur? Yeah, well, this is the question and and it's expensive enough at the moment. It um, is. So wouldn't it be more appealing to be able to increase your security deposit that subject to, you know, there's no real damage that you would get back at the end of your tenancy? Well, that that seems a fair option, doesn't it? Yeah, it does seem fairer. Yeah, really. The heartbreak, you know, the, the consequences of this, if negotiation doesn't go in your favour or, you know, you're shortlisted to, you know, the ideal tenant who's never there, <laughs> you know, works in the city um, and all the rest of it, to you working from home <laughs> with your multi-poo, for example, and yes. you don't pass the exam, as it were. But the consequences of that can be pretty heartbreaking, aren't it? <laughs> Yeah, they can. No, they can. And it's it's tough. It, it's tough because, and also you've got to be able to move quickly um, on properties nowadays. You know, you get a call and things go before they even get onto the property portals. So you're up against that as well. Gosh, gazumpig. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. It's a minefield, isn't it? I'm um, really. And I think this is something that anybody thinking about bringing a, a you know a dog or a cat into their life does need to think about. Yeah, maybe research properties first. You know, rather do it the other way around. Get get the get the property. Get be secure. Then bring your dog in. Well, that's one way of doing it. And you can do service accommodation, which, of course, is a lot more expensive. But some people prefer to do that. Come over, find a long let, but, you know, have or, or bring their pets and be in short term accommodation, which is pet friendly, uh, whilst they look for their long let. But also, I think, you know, working a lot on the London market, you've got to remember that there are a lot of bigger blocks that have no pets clauses. And some of the landlords don't even know they have no pets clauses because they don't have pets themselves. So they say to the estate agent, yes. You're allowed a dog or you're allowed a cat, but actually the building says no. And funny enough, Anna, the other thing is people, if people are looking to buy a property in a block, they also need to check whether the pet is allowed as well, because it doesn't make any difference whether you rent or you own the property. If the building has a no pets clause, your pet's not living with you. Trust me, I've been here. <laughs> I know. I was going to segue to leasehold properties. Um, so thank you. This is great. So it is to be aware that even if you do own your, your property, but it is a leasehold, check for that no pet clause. Well, many years ago, very quick, I got Molly when I'm, I was living actually with my boyfriend on Lambs Conduit Street in a, you know, owned freehold property. Amazing. Yeah, great. And then anyway, went back to my flat in Hoxton and I knew it was a no pets actually. And I just thought crumbs, I'm going to try and fly under the radar. Well, that wasn't exactly going to be easy with a miniature bull terrier. So I ended up in, it turned out, you know, the universe flew in, right? Because the head 
of the Housing Association was the girlfriend of this guy called Mark, who is the son of the secretary of the Miniature Bull Terrier Club of, of England, right? So I'd I'd made friends with them because he spotted Molly and went, oh my gosh, my mother's got to meet you, it's Mary Bowen, you've got to contact her, blah, blah, all this happened. So then I flew into the world of the Miniature Bull Terrier thing. So Molly was defended at the, at the association meeting and um, because I, I had an office then and I she was never home alone and all the rest of it and didn't cause any trouble um in fact she she was I felt she was an asset to everyone so it was kind of it was an old Peabody Victorian place you know in Hoxton and so it was gated and lot you saw lots of familiar faces every day and made friends it was a really it was brilliant actually I mean gosh trust me I wish I'd never sold it when I did (laughs) I'd quite like to sell it now (laughs) no I'm joking but um long story short she was able to stay because I basically said look all right she needs a garden anyway I didn't have a garden. So here's the deal. I'll put the flat on the market tomorrow. Okay. And we'll be gone. In the meantime, she's not here in the day. There's there's not going to be any reason for any complaints, which there never was. And But it was all because of this chance meeting with the son of the secretary of the Miniature Bull Terrier Club of, of, of the UK. Can you believe that? Otherwise, it's, we would have been homeless. <laughs> it's, a small, it's a small world, isn't it? It's a really yes. small world. It is totally extraordinary, actually. And then when I finally did move, I took on another leasehold and I made sure that Molly's name was actually on the lease. Yes, that's the that's it, the pets clause. And a rental agreement always have a pets clause. And I always say to people, do not sign a tenants agreement without a pets clause. And ideally with, as you mentioned, the name of your dog or cat and uh, breed, etc., yeah, but what surprises me is that landlords are clamping down on on young children, you know, because I would have thought that was against the law. <laughs> well, I kind of think, and it leads into the debate of how much are landlords encroaching onto tenants' lifestyles? I mean, the tenant pays a lot of money to live in a property. They can't put up pictures or anything without the permission or, you know, making any marks on walls, et cetera, without permission from the landlord. You have to have permission to have a pet, and then suddenly... You don't know whether you can have a child in your own property. No, no, gosh, I mean, it's all a bit scary, isn't it? Yeah, it's sort of like Big Brother kind of magnified, isn't it? <laughs> it is a, it is a bit. And this whole Section 21 eviction notice side is very passionate on both sides of landlords, with landlords and with tenants, and will be a big thing when the next government, probably Labour, get in. Yes, yes. So is that all going to be in the renters reform bill? You know, I mean, and also are pets involved in the renters reform bill if this, you know, proceeds into proper discussion? Yeah, they will be. They will be. No, no, they definitely will be. Um, They will be. But the trouble is, it's not just the legislation that's the issue is you're dealing with estate agents. A lot of estate agents that I talk to will just say no to pets. They just hear the word pets and they go no. There's not, let me f- pick up the phone to a landlord. It's been empty for a while. Let's see if he or she might be flexible just to get some rent in and, and then allow a, a small dog or a cat. It, it's just a flat no. And I think that is a real problem because you also find, and having been a state agent many, many years ago, is that people, they'll go for an instruction and they're too afraid to say to the landlord, will you allow pets? Because all they care about is getting the instruction on board and they don't want to upset the landlord. And they know that in the current market, which is competitive, they'll probably get someone without a pet. It's such a worry, you know. I mean, that's why, you know, I had this phase where oh, I moved around a bit, really. I was, um, I had to help my mum and moved to Shropshire, but there was nowhere for me to rent up there. Everyone was saying, just rent up there, Anna. For heaven's sake, don't buy a property in Shropshire. Anyway, I had to buy a property in Shropshire. I mean, it's just obviously mad, right? You know, so basically the equity from... My flat in Mortimer Road <laughs> after Hoxton has basically, you know, bankrolled me basically around the shires back into to London, you know. But, there, you know, I couldn't have done that and helped my mum because there was nowhere, nowhere. And it just was too complicated. So I would have had to have gotten rid of, you know, my family, basically. Yes. Right? My, so I had to buy somewhere, you know, which was kind of a bit extreme, perhaps. Luckily, it all ended well. But yeah, I just think it's such a shame. Animals bring us so much and they enrich our lives and, you know, they help with our mental health and all yes. of these aspects. And I think these are the these are the selling points, you know, that 
I'm sure, I know government understand that there's a lot of dog lovers in all parties in in parliament you know so it's about this message that in this particular world we're living in at the moment where there is a you know a lot of illness mental health we're living more isolated lives because of the internet you know and having a dog and a cat I mean I'm a great cat fan as well they really really make the difference to otherwise what could be quite a boring day <laughs> into a day that's that's lovely and and you have you know connection with another living species in real life well that's true I mean they make such a difference to people's lives and I, I think it's a real shame that you know it's funny because um what I'm finding out is more and more people, and you've, you've probably come across it as well, more and more people are actually not telling their landlords they have a pet. So they're always looking over their shoulder. And, you know, if there's a, a landlord inspection, they hide all the evidence and leave the property. I'd say about 30 odd percent of tenants are doing that at the moment. Gosh, I mean, that's a risk. I mean, that would, I'd, I'd be awake all night worrying, you know, I'm a, I'm a warrior. So, I mean, but that's, you know, a dramatic step to have to take, isn't it really? Well, it's true, but I mean, I, I, you know, a lot of people are doing it. I did a, I do TikTok. um, And uh, one of the, I did a video about that. And a lot of people were saying, yeah, I hide the evidence. I sit in the car and wait for the landlord to come and go, you know, and they just make sure that everything is hidden, you know, whether it's the, the, the bowls, the leads, whatever, it's gone, the toys, they're all disappeared. Golly, gosh, gosh. Well, I was having a conversation with someone randomly in the in the park with a dog friend of mine, and uh, and he's having a problem, and that suddenly it's in social housing and the dog can't stay. And I met the dog, and he was just begging for someone to be able to look after this dog in the day. You know, my friend offered some advice, so did I, and you know, and really to stress that this dog has enriched his life so much. He was saying, I never thought I'd be out at this time of the day, you know, out in the park, taking in fresh air, seeing things, meeting people, talking to people. And yes. he was just clearly loving this dog so much and nothing wrong with the dog at all. A real sweetie had had a bad start and he'd happened to take it in to help. And now he's facing separation from this dog. And, and then that's going to impact on him and a lovely person as well. So I just just think there's a lot more to this than just making decisions based on money this is what I get most depressed about every day I think is that money oh it kind of it takes the humanity out of being human it does and, and I find it quite shocking when you come across landlords who are themselves pet owners but they don't allow pets into their properties oh that's just seriously confused <laughs> it is but it's just as you said it's money isn't it they just put money ahead of people's welfare but and they're the very people who should understand it i think it's so upsetting surely there's such things still as community communication and and feedback you know surely landlords like to be liked uh, I think <laughs> landlords are about as popular as traffic wardens. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. I know, yeah, not my favourite side, I must say. It'd be awful to go around thinking everybody hated you, you know. I, well, change seriously needs to happen, you know. It's that 30, what worries me about this conversation the most is that 30% of pet owners are, gosh, flying under the radar simply so that they aren't made to compromise having a, a pet in their life, which whilst it's not mandatory, you know, it's not everyone's right to have a pet. They are living sentient beings. But when you get it right, you, you know, having animals in your life, I think is the greatest enrichment possible. They're, they're so grounding. And, and, and especially at the moment with this technology overload that we're all desperately trying to navigate do you know what I mean am I making yeah. am I gone into a rant no 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 not at all I know, I know what you mean and that was the interesting thing from all the comments on that particular TikTok video was that the fact that you know they seem to be a lot of youngsters there that that basically I pay the rent so the mindset was I can do what I want and if I want to have a cat or a dog I'm gonna ha I'm gonna do it and I don't really care what the landlord thinks that is the mindset Yes, well, good, you know, it's a very stand your ground approach, which because it's it's not very nice to have this spectre hanging over you the whole time, is it? You know, it's bullying, basically. Let's let's be quite clear about it. I would say, you know, it's a bit like the godfather, but I mean, you know, it's not far off, is it? Yeah, it, it's it's controlling, isn't it? It's telling people what they can't do, what can and can't do. And at the same time, 
you know, they they pay to live there. Um, and I think some something's got to give. And then you get all these shocking stories of of landlords not repairing properties, you know, uh, giving the Section 21 notice so that they have to move out and and then uh, putting the rent up and getting someone else in. Yeah, I mean, you know, things like damp and other issues like that, I think is just really inhumane. You know, that's not good for animals or people, you know. Yeah, I just think, you know, it's it's an area that there seriously, obviously, is a lot of money sloshing around. So I think everyone should, you know, be honourable and do their jobs to the best of their ability. And if if you're a landlord, then do it really well. Be a shining example and become you know, famous and recognised for that, that yes, all your properties are pet friendly and, you know, and you've got happy tenants and um, the world would be a better place. <laughs> I agree. There are, you know, I know there are some landlords that are, are brilliant, you know, they they do love pets, you know, and they're very caring, particularly if, if it was their own family home, they want the right profile of tenants. So it's not just about money. And and I do come across it where it's not the highest offer that's accepted. It's, it's where they'd want a family to live there, et cetera, and enjoy their home because they've enjoyed it. But on the other hand, you know, there are some pet owners who are very irresponsible, who also give fellow pet owners a bad name. So, for example, I, I was talking to um, an agent I've known for years recently, and she told me the story of um, a landlord who couldn't get into his property because the tenants were sick. They, they kept saying they had COVID, et cetera. So he couldn't get in. And then he found out that the property above his flat, because his flat was a garden flat, was on the market for sale. So he pretended to go in to look at it to buy, looked out the back window, looked onto his patio and saw it just covered in dog poo and gave them notice. Gosh, really? I mean, And that the trouble is things like that, if that landlord has a portfolio, suddenly his portfolio it won't be pet friendly because of that. I know this is the thing though, in all walks of life, it's always, I think, well... It's you true, know, like, yeah. It's the minority. I have to say, you know, picking up who is one of my bugbears at the moment, and I, I don't like, it's not good to point fingers, but, you know, this issue wasn't happening before the pandemic. And no. post-pandemic, we've gone backwards where who is concerned, you know, and that is symptomatic of much more, you know, symptomatic of perhaps not training your dog to the best, you know, that you can. Um, uh, it's symptomatic. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually not a small thing at all, but it is, if you can't be bothered to do that, you know, what are you bothered to do in terms of your dog? Well, that's it. And, you know, those very landlords will walk through they're human beings they will walk through commons and parks and they will see poo and subconsciously they'll think they'll think about it it'll be in their head that when someone puts in an offer and they've got a dog it's going to trigger that subconscious of all oh, poo will it pick it up you know I can't believe how many times I walk around I mean I love going to um, Wimbledon Common I think it's great but I have so many times seen poo bags hanging in the trees like a bobble on a Christmas tree why would you pick up poo in a poo bag and then just leave it hanging off the tree? I know everyone's got to accept their responsibilities for a dog because there's so much possible stuff lurking in the background with animal welfare organisations at the moment to bring in an exam. Oh, I, mean, I don't know how they'd ever police it, but bring in an exam, like a driving test, a driving mm. testing, really. So before you drive a car, you've got to be able to show that you can drive a car like a driving test. You know, do you know? what a dog should eat you know do you understand why you have to pick up your dog's poo it could be multiple choice I don't know and then maybe something like that you see would actually work in favor of renting with pets because then you are approved you know you've passed you know you are a responsible owner you understand your your commitments to your dog on a daily basis you know what I'm saying and that yes. could actually help I think that could help society quite a lot at the moment mm. well maybe 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 a basic training course is mandatory for new dog owners, you know, something like that, that people have to do that. I know it's maybe an extra expense, just thinking off the top of my head, but maybe that's a good qualification that goes on the pet CV and that that, that helps you find a property because you've done it. Yeah, exactly. And a test before you've got the dog. So that I think as well and the training, but that's where a dog license, you see, could come in, providing the money was ring fenced like it is in, in some uh, European countries so that 
you've got a safety net you're you're creating you're you're helping people be responsible it's all about helping and it needn't be expensive it could even be offered practically for free all of this because that would be funded by the dog license but indeed everybody would benefit i mean it's just ironic isn't it we're in the uk we're known as a pet loving nation and lots of more department stores and shops and boutiques you know they welcome dogs and you see bowls outside boutique uh, clothes shops and all of that but yeah that the last bastion of not being pet friendly is the rental market or well, the housing market full stop yeah yeah and without that I mean this is it there's an irony everything's gone a little bit out of balance really you have to have somewhere to live and an appropriate accommodation for your dog I mean going back you know with Molly I didn't plan to stay in the flat because I didn't have a garden for me it was important that she had a garden and that's what we I bought her a garden you know uh, and that's all part of this going back to why have you got a dog? Are you with me? I'm not trying yes. to stop yeah, yeah. people from getting dogs, but for the dogs and the people long term, I think it's good to have a, a really clear understanding of the commitment you're going into. I mean, arguably, arguably, she says and underlines it, you know, children go to school. They legally have to go to school. So in a way, children, you know, with children and they're, what's going to happen through the life stages, you, you know, ultimately they're going to leave. Right. But a dog never does that, you know, and dogs arguably, you know, daycare isn't the greatest thing for some dogs. You know, other dogs might be OK. Other dogs also m might not be OK. The idea is in the olden days when my dad was involved with the RSPCA, someone had to be at home for the majority of all the time to be allowed to adopt a dog. Mm. It's only become a little bit more flexible, I think, over the years as abandonment has increased over the years. And of course, at the moment now, it's at peak that there literally, literally is no more room and people are scared to adopt because um, people are worried about expense you know if you've not got a dog at the moment you want one but you've got to think well gosh I can't I don't think I'm going to be able to afford it you know so but all this hopefully will change in in due course you know ultimately having a sound accommodation is is pivotal isn't it pivotal oh totally it is totally pivotal and you know they are they're part of your family they're the children you know you can't you're not going to leave home or move somewhere else without your children and and it's just wrong for landlords to expect people to do that. Um, yeah, it's just it's totally wrong. And I think a lot of landlords don't get it. They just look purely at the profit. And I think that has to change. And I think there is that needs to be a push for legislation. And I think for the whole overhaul of the whole rental rental market. I mean, even that even in or buying a property, the whole leasehold is antiquated. It's 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 crazy. I mean, you do I work a lot with the European well, people from overseas, Europeans, you know, overseas states, Canada. And, you know, I don't think people could get their head around the fact you you buy a property which you can only own for a certain period of time, a leasehold. Doesn't make any sense. No, 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 I know, I know. I mean don't talk to me about leaseholds, but sorted it finally but yeah yes I've been through hell and back in terms of uh, a leasehold situation we see not where the animals were concerned but yeah. even bigger than that so it was, but um it's sorted now I'm a freeholder um but it yeah it, it was a journey and um yeah um, a massive struggle actually but yes <laughs> yes that I wouldn't wish on anyone so do you think if the renters reform bill goes ahead after the election do you think positive change is going to happen from it Russell yeah, I think that I think there will be positive change, but I think that people are also um, have going to have to realise that just because they have a pet, they won't necessarily always get a property. I think it will help the chances, but there will still be people in front of them in the queue, and a landlord, as I mentioned earlier, will still look for an excuse to go with someone else. Um, so I think it, I don't think there'll be change overnight, um, but I think it's I think more and more estate agents have got to become pet pet friendly um and they've got to help people more more with pets and that's not happening at the moment there are some agencies who are great who are really good with pets um and others uh are, are not so so i think it it won't be an overnight change but um it'll be harder for landlords to say no but they'll come up with an ex but people need to bear in mind they will come up with an excuse the property is not big enough or it doesn't work well for that they'll they'll, they'll come up with something
Oh, well, look, let's hope, let's hope the future is brighter, Russell, you know, and I know you're doing your best, you know, you I mean, Pets Let's is, is great. It's brilliant. So we need more people like you, Russell, although they obviously can't be because you're unique. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm unique, but I mean, I love it. I mean, it's, it's, it's great to see happy clients and they move into their place and you hear back from them and see the pictures, which is wonderful. And I'm not, not trying to put a down on it. I just think that a lot of people just think that when once legislation comes in, they can they just will be allowed a property full stop. And that isn't going to, you know, you're dealing with very passionate landlords. I mean, I once put a comment on a landlord Facebook group and I got some serious comments back. So it's not something that the landlords are going to roll over um, on um, and it will and it will take time. And I think part of what I do is to try and educate landlords and estate agents about the benefits of people with pets they stay longer um you know they're more responsible because they value where they live really good point and of course I would say this as well that if you have a dog in your life you know or a cat you're not going to go out clubbing all night come back and throw up everywhere but you know um <laughs> you, you are you know you're you're more serious you understand commitments and I do believe you know, people with dogs are arguably more trustworthy you know and and these sorts of things are obviously important to a landlord. Yes, yes, they are. Um, they are. And I think when you're dealing with estate agents, if you can just try and get the estate agent on your side, people like to be asked for help and advice. So if you can help, you know, talk to the landlord and say, look, can you help me here? What else do I need to do? You know, what what's the landlord looking for here? Is it longevity in the property? You know, is it price? Is it is it they're looking for a nice family to move in because they love the home? You know, ask ask for help from an estate agent um yes they do represent the landlord but there are some estate agents who actually are pet owners themselves and they want to help just ask them yeah 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 and perhaps start the process by ringing up your good self russell you know so if anyone's listening all the links to everything will be in the show notes russell so this is great thank you so much for this chat today no, thank you. Thank you, Anna, um, very much. It's good. Really enjoyed it. And it's, it's, it's it, hopefully it's, it's an area that will um, improve with, with, with the new legislation, whoever comes into government. Yes, let's hope so. Fingers crossed. <laughs> or pause crossed. Yes, pause crossed. Thanks, <laughs> Russell. Woof, woof. <laughs> woof, woof. <laughs> thank you, Anna. That's our show, Mr. Binks. What did you think? Yes, I think landlords should be more flexible and understand the great benefits that dogs bring. And you're right, it is time for Woof of the Week. Well, let's hope after the election that the Renters Reform Act will take priority and renting with pets will become easier. Well, I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, go on, rate and review the show wherever you tune into your podcasts, because it really does make a difference. Thanks again, of course, to Russell Hunt for joining us today and all the links to get hold of Russell at Pets Let's are in the show notes. Thanks, of course, to Mike, my producer, for all the music and production as ever. What's that, Mr. Binks? Yes, you're right. We will be back in your feed next Sunday. So go on. Why don't you subscribe? It's free. And that way you'll never miss another show. Bye for now. Bye.